Let us, therefore, create a new guild of craftsmen, free of the divisive class pretensions that would endeavor to raise a prideful barrier between craftsmen and artists. This was the manifesto of Walter Gropius, founder of the Bauhaus School in Weimar, Germany. His manifesto called for the collaboration of artists and craftsmen, which ushered in that balance of form and function that we call modern design. Bauhaus was a German art school that existed briefly between World War I and World War II, and visionaries at the time saw opportunities to use art and technology to advance society. And it was with this outlook that Walter Gropius founded Bauhaus. His goal was to redefine the way art was taught across the country. In the early 20th century, they revolutionized the mass production of goods with modular and flat pack furniture. And they turned their noses up at art history, ignoring the educational traditions and pushing the boundaries of art. They broke down the concepts of color, shape, and media and looked on them with fresh eyes. And they applied their observations to graphic design too. The rules of gestalt, layout, and typography that were established from their stripped back approach to creativity are still studied and practiced by designers to this day. I had the great fortune to visit the Bauhaus archive in Berlin, which tells the history of the school and exhibits and collects artifacts from its past. And it was there that I got to thinking about how I could apply some of their ideals to the web. The designers of the avant-garde experimented with new tools, new revelations of psychology and science, and new means of production, and this landscape was prepping them for a burst of creativity and innovation. Today, the internet has once again evolved our society, yet nearly a century after the fact, we're only just now able to apply some of the concepts of Bauhaus to the web with new specifications from the W3C. So there are five topics that I want to explore today viewport units, transforms, grid, shapes, and blending modes, and I'm going to apply these to various works by artists of the avant-garde. So starting out, let's talk about Kurt Schwitters. He was a Dada artist who, was, um, who used found objects to make these psychological collages, which he called Mertz, in order to reject the reason and logic of the bourgeois capitalist society and make sense of the world around him. Sounds pretty good. These collages, for which Schwitters is best known, can get pretty abstract, so I'm going to focus on something a little bit more down to earth. This magazine of his, also called Mertz, uh, that I saw at the Vancouver Art Museum. It was typeset by Ella Sitsky, who was a frequent collaborator with Bauhaus, and I thought it would make for an interesting typographic experiment for the web. And I spent an afternoon and I put this web-based reproduction together. It's a pretty close reconstruction, but the real beauty of it is that it's shockingly consistent at any screen size. So here you can see it. We'll go into responsive mode. Oh no. Find the little thing. Uh, we'll scroll down a little bit. So you can see when we resize it that the text stays pretty consistent no matter what size you're at. So, I was able to do this with viewport units. Um, these are a unit of measurement that are relative to the width of the viewport. So basically one viewport length is equal to 1% of the screen length. And there are four kinds of viewport units, but today I only have time to talk about two of them. VH is relative to the viewport's height, and VW is relative to its width. And you can use viewport units to size pretty much anything that you want, but it has a very interesting effect on typography, as you saw. So let's think about the old way of resizing type for the screen. There's kind of a lot going on here, so just focus your attention on the main part here. So here I sized my text in points, not viewport. Designed this mobile first, so on this iPhone size display, it's looking pretty good. But when that screen size increases, the line length increases while that type stays the same size. And with this justified type, it just looks wrong and it starts to get out of control. But when I size with viewport units instead, then the text acts almost like an image or an SVG when it's being resized. There's a lot of nuance in how this text is laid out, but that stays true no matter what size the browser is. The justification is constant, the design is consistent, and again, I'll switch to Firefox and you can see that now that you understand how it works. So, 
the text really stays in the same place because of viewport units. One thing you have to worry about um, is that if you look at the text near the top there, it gets um, pretty small, like really small. So um, we want to make sure that our text is going to be accessible. Um, when you use viewport units, even if a user hits like command plus or control plus, the type isn't going to resize. It's going to stay that exact same size. So if it gets too small, users can't resize their type. Sarah Sweden tweeted a little while ago, um, basically don't use uh, viewport units to size, size typography. And generally, I do agree with that. For You don't want to do this with body type or um, big blocks of type. But I do think that there's a, an appropriate use when you're doing art-directed things like this magazine cover, where um, you want things to lay out in a very consistent way. Um, but you do need to make sure that you throw in extra breakpoints to make sure that that text can be readable um, at smaller sizes. And if you want to know more about sizing type with uh, viewport units, check out a talk by Keith Grant called Stop Thinking in Pixels. It's really great. So browser support is pretty good. Internet Explorer and Edge don't support VMAX, but everything else works. Um, other browsers have full support. Uh, Opera Mini doesn't support them, so if that's on your support list, then you're going to have to figure out how those um, text units are going to fall back. Jan Schickold is one of my personal favorites. He was a typographer who was so inspired by Bauhaus that he became one of the leading practitioners of modernist design. He would eventually go on to write the new typography, create layout systems for Penguin Books, and design posters for Phoebus Palast, a movie theater in Berlin. So take a look at his movie poster called, um, uh, for a German film called The Woman With No Name. Take a, take a look at that title. It looks like it's zooming off into the distance. Well, we can replicate this to some degree using transforms. Transforms are CSS functions that you can use to manipulate the geometry of elements. You can rotate them or skew them or move them around on the page. They've been standardized for a long time now, but I wanted to shed some light on one transform in particular. Perspective. Perspective allows you to transform elements on a 3D plane. And there are two ways to apply perspective. One is on an element-by-element -element basis using the transform property. And in this way, each element has its own perspective or its own vanishing point. And the other way is to declare a perspective on a parent element using the perspective property. And every child element transformed within that parent will share the same vanishing point, so they'll all kind of coexist in the same world. In recreating Chickles poster, let's take a look at that title again. There are two parts to it. There's the title, the woman with no name, and the subheading in red which says part two. And these two elements share the same vanishing point, so we're going to use the perspective property on a containing element. And when you use perspective, you have to set its length, but it's a little bit tricky figuring out what that should be. And that length indicates the simulated distance you are away from the 3D plane, which is just kind of a complicated way of saying that it sets the intensity of the 3D effect. So a high perspective value means you're further away from the 3D plane, so the distortion is low, as you can see in the top, um, the second example there. And a low perspective value means you're closer to the plane, so distortion is no more noticeable. And perspective is different than Translate Z in that perspective is the distance from the 3D plane, whereas Translate Z is the distance from the element itself, uh, which is kind of weird to parse. So for me, I like to think of it as zoom versus dolly. Uh, if you're thinking cinem cinematically, when you zoom in with the camera, you stay in the same place while the lens closes the distance um, to the subject, and that's going to change the distortion a bit. Uh, that's kind of like perspective. And then dollying is just the fancy term for actually physically moving forward and backward in space, uh, and that's translate Z. And so this is sometimes called the vertical effect, or I'm sorry, you can actually do a dolly zoom now with CSS. So sometimes called the vertigo effect after Alfred Hitchcock's movie. Um, yeah, you get a, you get a dolly zoom. Uh, and this has been used throughout film and television to emphasize something disconcerting. And now we can recreate this with CSS. So unfortunately, I don't have time to go into this um, in a lot of detail, but I did throw together an example I want to share with you. Welcome to the Frankie Zone. <laughs> 
Um, so when you hover over this, then you get this very disconcerting effect. Uh, it's kind of fun because uh, his ears and his nose are on separate planes. So it gives this nice 3D effect. Uh, let's make sure we don't go back to that one. <laughs> Um, I did write a blog entry about this, though, um, on my website. Uh, blog's still sort of a thing. Uh, so you can go there to check out more. That's at robotpuppy.com. But getting back to the poster design, for my header, I set a perspective and then stacked up a couple other transforms to get the optimal look that I was going for. And here is the result. So the text now has some perspective. It's not exactly the same as Chickold's perfect pointy vanishing point. Um, but that's because he was simulating perspective, and we're actually using a real 3D perspective, and so that's going to change the way that um, it lays out on a, on a website. But it still creates an interesting effect, and it foreshadows the surefire adventure of the woman with no name. And I did also similarly add a transform to this one, or a, a transition to this one. So you can see when I move over it, then the, some of the photos come into focus. And it does a little bit of dolly zoom action. All right, let's talk about browser support. So transforms can be challenging, but at this point, browser support is actually pretty good. Um, Internet Explorer has a caveat with nested 3D elements. But other than that, I think we're more than ready to add this to our toolbox. Moving on, let's talk about Pete Mondrian, who in 1922 could still get away with that mustache. <laughs> He's probably the most widely recognized artist of the five presented here today, and he was a notable member of the De Stiel movements, and his paintings of rectangles are the model of moder modernism in two dimensions. Mondrian's composition paintings create a graphic tension and balance with nothing more than basic shapes and primary colors laid out into a grid. And Mondrian seems to be the gold standard for experimenting with grids in HTML. Here's composition number 10, recreated by JavaScript artist Jen Schiffer. And she used this as a test case for a script that automatically creates Mondrian-inspired compositions on the fly. Uh, she keeps this and other JavaScript toys at her website, vart.institute. Uh, make sure you say vart with a, with a distinct V. Uh, and she is also here today teaching a glitch workshop, so check that out. Um, but developers have struggled for years to hack grid layouts together, including using tables like Jen used, as well as floats and flex boxes. And we've gotten pretty good at it. But grid is here, and it's the first time we can create real layouts using two-dimensional grids on the web. Your grids can be pretty complicated, but the CSS can be quite concise and much more predictable. So for this composition that we're working on, um, I've started out with a bunch of divs. And then I put the new display grid property onto the container. And next, I'm going to need to specify the dimensions of my grid area. So I'm going to count up the columns and rows and then size them to fit. So writing this out in CSS is pretty straightforward. I put each measurement into the grid template one by one and separate them with a space. <coughs> and finally, I specified the grid gap, which keeps the grid cells from crashing into each other. You can specify the horizontal and vertical gaps separately. And so finally, we have a grid system that takes care of the gaps. We don't have to worry about double margins and, or double padding and collapsing margins and all that, that nonsense. It's already done for you. And the browser will auto lay out each grid section. So if your grid section the browser already expects them to fit, you don't need to declare them. So since A, this first section, fills up a single column and a single row, we don't actually have to tell the browser to do anything in CSS. And if your grid section spans more than one column or row, so take a look at E here, which spans two rows, then you'll declare the start and end values explicitly. And um, in this case, our end value is at the end of the grid. So you can see it's on row four here. So instead of declaring grid row end five, which you could do, um, we can also declare grid row end negative one, which has uh, some uses. And the code we need to create this grid is pretty clean, thanks to that auto layout. We're just declaring B, C, D, and E. And you can clean it up even further with the shorthand property. So this is basically all that you need to create Mondrian's Composition 2 in red, blue, and yellow. 
which you can see here. And um, if, you, if you may have noticed, I sized in viewport units. So no matter how we resize this, it stays perfectly proportional to Mondrian's original proportions. Um, and there are no scroll bars or anything like that. So pretty fun. Oops. So there is a ton more to learn about grid, and this, more than anything else I'm talking about today, um, is really worth digging into extensively at this point. Um, if you want to learn more, be sure to check out Rachel Andrews' site, Grid by Example. She's been keeping up with the spec since basically forever and pretty much knows everything there is to know about grid. So Grid by Example is an essential resource that I can't recommend highly enough. And good news, grid is supported in all of these browsers today, except for Opera Mini, I guess. But um, unfortunately, while Microsoft led the charge into um, implementing Grid, Internet Explorer and Edge are still using an outdated legacy syntax. However, boom, October 17th, CSS Grid in Microsoft Edge. That's less than a week away. <laughs> so. Bauhaus was an important school in design history, but it wasn't without its flaws. Women were encouraged to attend, but then often discouraged from pursuing their passions, and they were rarely given proper recognition. Marianne Brandt managed to push through the gender barrier and became the first woman to join the metalworking program, and eventually she even became its deputy head. But while her male counterparts were prolific after World War II, Brandt remained in obscurity until after her death. She worked in many different media, but she isn't known for graphic design, so instead of recreating something that she made, I thought I'd design a page about her and show off a particularly notable creation of hers, this gorgeous little tea infuser. So here's the page I created. Take another look at that teapot. Notice how the text flows around it, following its roundness? That's because I've created a shape. Shapes are a new way for text to render on a web page. Instead of strictly following the edge of a square or rectangle only, shapes allow us to flow text around and inside any arbitrary shape we can think of. Specification breaks these up into a few modules, but I'm just going to cover this first one because it's the only one we can really use freely today. So let's start out with the humble circle. We can pretty easily create a round shape using border radius, but of course, border radius is only an illusion. Even though the image appears to be elliptical, the text still flows around the containing square. Well, with shapes, an ellipse can actually be an ellipse. To create a shape, you need to float your element first so that text will flow around it, and then use the shape outside property to define your shape. Your shape can be based on any shape box, the content box, the padding box, the margin box or the border box. And some shapes that you can create are an ellipse, circle, or inset box, or you can create more complex shapes with a polygon. And text is going to ignore your regular margins, but you can set a shape margin to keep flow content from crowding your shape. And shape outside and shape margin intersect with that shape box, meaning that shapes and shape margins can go outside the shape box, but anything beyond that shape box boundary is going to be ignored. So if you take a look at that A there, it's not being pushed back by the shape margin. That's because it's outside of the shape box. So in a way, shape margin actually makes our shape look a little bit more like this. All right, uh, so the shape I use here is pretty simple, but it makes for a nice impact on the appearance of the design. And if a browser doesn't support shapes, text still flows around the float like normally, no problem. So shapes are under consideration for Edge and in development for Firefox. I hear they're coming pretty soon to Firefox, I think. Um, but they are uh, already supported in other browsers. And it's, like I said, it's really easy to start using them today as a progressive enhancement because it just falls back to a regular float. Herbert Beyer is counted among the second wave of masters who taught at Bauhaus. And this calling card of his is not one of his more well-known works, but I like it because it gives me an excuse to talk about blending modes. Blending modes are one of those things that have been in Photoshop for quite a long time, but they've finally come to the web, and they let you quickly create colorization or textural effects. 
There are a lot of different blending modes that we could talk about, but today I'm going to share with you a couple um, that I think are especially useful. And I'll demonstrate how they work on one of Bayer's later works called Chromatic Twist 1970. This is gonna be our bottom layer, which we'll call layer B. And I'm gonna blend this texture on top of it. We'll call this one layer A. And you'll see how the different tints and shades change based on the blending mode that you choose. So first let's take a look at the multiply blending mode. This mode is called multiply because it's literally multiplying the properties of the top layer with the layer below it. And this is how that function looks. A is the top layer, B is the bottom layer, X is the resulting color, X equals A times B. So how do you multiply colors together exactly? Well, it works like this. The browser breaks up the color components into red, green, and blue, converts their luminosity values to a scale between zero and one, and then multiplies those values together. Then the browser converts back to RGB and recombines the new RGB value into the new color. So yeah, all this creative stuff is just math underneath. <laughs> Woo. More practically though, what you need to know about the multiply blending mode is that the darker the pixel on top is, the more likely it is to show through at its full value. So if the top layer pixel is black, then it becomes completely opaque. And if it's white, as you see on the bottom there, it becomes completely transparent. Everything in between darkens to some degree. So you can think of it kind of like casting a shadow across the bottom layer. A shadow is always going to darken. And the opposite of multiply is called screen. So as you can see in this demonstration, a top layer pixel that's white is opaque this time, while a black pixel will become completely transparent. And this is kind of like shining a bright light on your subject. But if screen is the opposite of multiply, why isn't it called divide? Because again, if you look at the math, you can see we're not doing any division here. Instead, we're taking the inverse of the inverse of A times the inverse of B, so actually more multiplication. Getting back to Byers calling card, it consists of three images. Each time the image is reprinted on the card, the ink covers up more of the paper, meaning it always makes the value darker and that means we're going to use the multiply blending mode. So this is how you do it in CSS. There are two ways to apply a blending mode. There's mix blend mode, and this is a way to blend HTML elements together, and background blend mode, which blends between multiple background images. So let's give this a try. I couldn't find the original source of Byers calling card, so I found another portrait of a European man that we can try this out with. <laughs> Uh, here's how it looks in the CSS. I've positioned this similarly to the way that Bayer did using the translate X transform, and then I just blended the elements together using mix, mix blend mode set to multiply. And here's the result. So with blending modes, I can change the particulars of this effect. I can move them around or, or um, even ch choose a different blending mode without having to go back into a graphics editor and reprocess and re-upload a new version. So it's pretty nice. And this is just the beginning when it comes to blending modes. If you'd like to learn more, I have another talk which you can look up. It's called Painting the Perfect Sunset. And I've also written a couple, a list of part articles when it comes um, to how we can blend color. Uh, blending modes demystified is in, about blending modes in particular. And also check out the work of the tireless Una Kravitz. Um, one of the things that she does is recreate Instagram filters with blending modes. And you can see that in her talk, Practical Blend Modes. Browser support for blending modes is getting there, but Edge has been slow to implement. Currently, it's listed as on the backlog. Um, Safari supports both CSS properties, both mixed blend mode and background blend mode, but unfortunately, it's missing some of the more useful blending modes, but it does at least do multiply and screen um, and a lot of others, but not some of the fun ones. So these artists of the early 20th century avant-garde and many more showed the way showed the world the way design was done. But they didn't just create the frameworks by which we still design today. They were gleefully experimental, interdisciplinary, and subversive. They collaborated together and argued with one another about best practices, and it pushed art and craft into a new century. We're well into a new century ourselves, and I encourage you to follow the examples of the modernist masters, not just in recreating their works, but in exploring the possibilities of how art and technology can create better designs.
Thank you very much. If you have any questions, please come up to me after this. We'll have a chat. My name is Justin McDowell. My website is at revoltpuppy.com, and you can hit me up on Twitter at revoltpuppy. Thank you so much. Thank you.